Hi, how are you? This is a wonderful turnout. I didn't think they could cram as many people into this room, but <laughs> now I see it is indeed possible. Um, it's wonderful to be here. I, I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk uh, with uh, groups around the country uh, about uh, certain things that I'm very passionate about. Uh, obviously, I'm here to talk about said cat, Oscar the Cat, and I'm, I'll be glad to answer questions uh, along the way or at the end. I always start by answering the question that I get most of all, and that is, can you breed Oscar? <laughs> Everybody wants to know, can you breed Oscar? So the answer is no, he's neutered. We are desperately trying to clone him at Brown. When we succeed, <laughs> I will let everybody know and you can order your little Oscars uh, for your, <laughs> your hospices and, and hospitals everywhere. But for, for the time being, Oscar is fairly unique, um, so no, you can't clone him. But at any rate, at any rate um, this is a nice crowd. There's people up there, wow. All right, so I'm here to talk to you today about Oscar. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my journey with, with Oscar. It's uh, kind of unusual. Um, last week I um, talked at a uh, conference in Lexington, Kentucky, and, and the governor was talking right before. I got up after the governor and pretty much told the audience that I was here to talk about a cat. It seemed kind of silly after we just <laughs> talked about health care and everything else, uh, the deficit and everything else that they had to talk about in Kentucky, and I'm here about to talk about a cat. But I do think that Oscar has a lot to teach us, and, and that's really what the subject of, uh, of my talk is. Um, so let's start with uh, the pictures. Uh, <laughs> I didn't bring Oscar with me. Everybody always wants to know, can, I, you, know, can you bring Oscar? Um, Oscar lives on the third floor at the Steerhouse Nursing and Rehabilitation Center. That's where he lives. It's his home since uh, he was born. And we don't, tend, we don't take him off the unit. Um, we made an agreement early on that we would take him to Oprah. But other than that, Oscar stays on the unit, so he doesn't travel with me, which is a good thing, because the first time I met Oscar, he bit me. <laughs> so let's cut to the chase. Date of birth, sometime early in 2005. Location of birth, unknown. Uh, I've heard lots of stories about where Oscar came from. Uh, we think he's from Krypton, but we're not really sure. Um, in truth, he came from a shelter, and he came from a shelter to replace an animal um, that had lived at the nursing home for about 10 years. Uh, the great thing is when this animal um, passed, uh, the nursing home realized that they missed him so much that they brought in six cats to replace the one. And Oscar was one of those six cats. He resides at the Steerhouse Nursing and Rehabilitation Center, which is in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, I always like to ask, how many people here have been to Rhode Island? Wow. I hazard to guess that most of you have driven that 20-mile stretch as you drive from Connecticut to Boston, um, or Connecticut to Massachusetts, uh, and uh, most people never really stop. But if you drive that little stretch of 95, uh, if you go about halfway through our state, um, you can't be sleeping because you'll miss it if you, uh, um, but at any rate, if you, if you drive about halfway and look off to the left, there's uh, Steerhouse Nursing and Rehabilitation Center. And the description, he's a black and white tabby, he's got a testy disposition. His favorite activity is doing what cats do, which is pretty much looking out of the window, finding a puddle of sunshine somewhere, plopping himself down where he's not wanted. Uh, but pretty much what cats do universally everywhere around the world. So why all the fuss about this cat? What's, what's the big deal about a, 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 a he's, he's a handsome cat, I'll give him that. But he can stand on his hind legs. We're very proud of that ability. But that's not what gets you a Wikipedia reference. So Oscar can do more than just stand on his hind legs. For those of you who haven't heard the story of Oscar, Oscar has been holding vigils for our patients at Steerhouse and has been doing so since he was about a year old. Um, we think he's held probably 60 to 70 vigils by now for patients. And there are times where Oscar seemingly is the first to know that someone on the third floor is, is near death. 
So this is Oscar holding one of his vigils. Um, basically, he'll sit there. He's not a people person. He's not a cat that you can pick up and cuddle with, uh, and nor w would he want to be near you most of the time. But something about end of life care, something about being with patients at the end draws him out of his shell and he comes and he sits and he holds a vigil, sometimes for 24 hours, sometimes for uh, 48 hours, uh, usually not longer than a few days, but uh, he's there uh, for these patients when they pass on. So what's all the fuss? I wrote about Oscar back in 2007. Uh, it was a little essay that I wrote on a bad day in my life. Um, I had uh, received word um, from a foundation in New York that uh, some research that I was uh, trying to get funded hadn't been funded. They called me and said all the nice things, you know, thank you for applying for this award. You know, you were a wonderful candidate, but you know, guess what, we're not funding you. So I was sitting in my office looking at the computer screen and probably had been staring at it for about two hours when the phone rang. And it was Mary Miranda who, for those who have read the book, is one of the nurses uh, that I, that I uh, characterized in the book. So she told me that um, I should come over to the nursing home, that there was a patient who was dying, and, and uh, I snapped at her. It was a bad day, and you know, I pretty much gave it back to her, and she told me to get over myself, as <laughs> any good nurse can tell a doctor. Um, that there were people having worse days out there than me, and she referenced uh, the daughter of the patient who was near the end at, at Steerhouse, and that maybe I should come over and, and give my condolences, and maybe that'll snap me out of whatever funk I was in. So I took her up on it, and I walked over to Steerhouse, which is actually, at that point, was across the street from my office, and walked into this room with a, a patient on the bed, and there was Oscar. Um, seated with uh, the patient's uh, family member. And I remember for the first time looking at Oscar, I had heard about what he was doing. Certainly we'd all talked about it kind of in jest for, for a while. And this was actually the first time I think I really looked. Um, we always t talk about um, there are times in your life, I think, where you're more receptive to actually hearing um, what's going on or seeing what's going on. And this was one of those occasions where I, in the context of this bad day, watched this cat sit there with the patient and said, this is really a remarkable thing. I went back to my office and I started writing. Um, about two hours later, I had come up with this essay in its first form um, that I walked down the hall um, to a colleague of mine and showed it to her and she, she came back into my office and said, you know, this is really good, you should send it somewhere. So again, as a joke, I said, well, why don't I send it to the best medical journal? <laughs> I'm having one of those days, I might as well get some stationery from them that says, <laughs> Thank you very much. You get the idea. Uh, at any rate, they agreed. About two weeks later, I got a phone call from the editor of said journal, and he, he asked me if what I had written about Oscar was actually true. And I said, well, I, I wouldn't have written it if it wasn't true. And uh, he said, well, that's good, because we've talked with a bunch of patient families already. And I kind of looked at, you know, sort of, thought, you know, how did they get a hold of all those people so fast? Uh, but he said, we really like it, and uh, we're interested in publishing it. Um, so I said, fine, and went about my day and called my wife and said, hey, I got something in the New England Journal of Medicine. And she said, who cares? Um, <laughs> and we went, <laughs> we went around our business uh, pretty much uh, like nothing else happened. And truthfully, nothing did happen um, for quite some time. The New England Journal of Medicine has an embargo date, and they usually get the stories out to reporters about a week in advance. And it was a pretty quiet week, actually. We had had a couple people come up locally, local papers. They wanted to take pictures. And I said, you know, this is kind of nice. At least, uh, you know, the Providence Journal or local paper will probably cover it. Um, but if you ever want a recipe for a media circus on a quiet news day in July, you've Take one part cat, talk about death and dying, and you have mass hysteria. 
When the embargo ended, I was actually on the swing set with uh, my youngest. My wife was running late, and, and all of a sudden at 6 o'clock, my cell phone started to ring. I have no idea how they got my cell phone, but they did. And then it started ringing again, and again, and again. And within the first 30 minutes, I probably had about 60 phone calls um, from various different media outlets. When you think about our media, you know, it's, it's very interesting. I had a couple months prior published what I thought was the best article that I'd ever written um, on delirium in the nursing home. I thought it was an incredibly important work. You know how many people called me up for that one? <laughs> but you write about a cat, and all of a sudden you're putting the BBC on hold to talk to CNN. But a, a funny thing happened. Uh, it was all about the cat. It was all about the headlines. And, and uh, true story, but uh, about 20 minutes into this whole media circus, um, the Today Show called and they said, you know, we'd like Oscar to be there tomorrow at 7.30 hour. We're going to send a limo for you and Oscar. And I said, well, you know, I, I'm going to have to make some phone calls. I really, you know, not sure I can bring Oscar to New York. And then two minutes later, the uh, Good Morning America show called and they're like, well, we heard the Today Show was going to bring you in. And they're going to bring you in by limo. We'd like to send a helicopter for you. And ask you. <laughs> Today Show called back. We've heard that Good Morning America is sending a helicopter. We're going to send something out. It, it, it was absolutely the craziest thing I've ever been involved in. And after a couple phone calls, I, I told the producer of I forget which one that I was less worried about going on national TV for the first time in my life than I was about being mauled by Oscar because he bit me the first time I met him and I wasn't about to carry this fluffy animal onto the set. Um, but at any rate, they came to us. But what was interesting about the whole thing was the headlines. Um, If Oscar's on your bed, you're dead. Uh, this was actually the front page headline for the London Times. Um, supposedly one of the best newspaper organizations in the world. Cat predicts death in nursing home. That sounds fine. But the USA Today, not to be outdone, puts a tag in there, Oscar the Grim Reaper. Furry angel of death, meet Oscar the cat. So the story was all about death cat story at 11. And lost in all of this was all the wonderful things I had said about Oscar and how he was providing this wonderful service for the patients and families of, of Steerhouse and, and how animals were important uh, um, in, in healthcare institutions. And it didn't matter. All they wanted was death cat story at 11. You know you've made it when you become a cartoon. <laughs> he... I had to take this slide out when I was at the Bush Library a few, <laughs> a few months ago. But I figure at the Clinton Library it's fair game. <laughs> And of course, you know you've made it in our popular culture when you've been on Saturday Night Live. And Oscar's been on Saturday Night Live now twice. And shortly thereafter, of course, feline Oscar heads to the big, big screen. So there is talk of Oscar becoming a movie. Whether or not that actually happens, you never know. But the bottom line is, and the Oscar goes to Oscar the Cat. <laughs> So my journey with Oscar has been very different. And, and what I'd like to talk to you guys about during the balance of uh, these comments uh, are really about my own journey with him and what I think we can learn from, from Oscar. In terms of my personal particulars, I'm one of only about 7,000 geriatricians in this country. Um, what is a geriatrician? Uh, we're physicians that specialize in the care of the elderly. Uh, unfortunately, that number is actually going down because many of us are actually geriatric in, in our own right. Um, geri geriatricians are, don't grow on trees. Uh, I've seen statistics where it's one for every 20,000 people over the age of 65. So if you need an appointment, call me soon. 
I'm also a health services researcher at, at Brown University. Uh, I love taking care of older adults because I, I find it fascinating. I think it is the biggest healthcare dilemma in our country and something that we better get our hands around pretty darn soon or otherwise we're, we're really going to be in crisis mode. I started um, in medical school, of course, like everybody else, thinking I was going to cure malaria. The only problem when you want to cure malaria is that you can't really live in your house with the picket fence and all that kind of stuff. You've got to be you going to places where there's malaria. Um, what I found when I did my master's in public health was that the health care for, uh, for the elderly was really our crisis. And back when I started, it was underappreciated. I think we've seen now that this coming demographic shift is going to really change the way we practice medicine, and we better be prepared for it. I work with clinical patients in a variety of different clinical settings. One of the places I work is the Steer House. This is the Steer House here. It's a nice nursing home. Uh, it's one of those places you would want a family member, but having said that, there's not one person in this room who would ever want to be taken care of in a nursing home, um, myself included. It's just not what we want for ourselves when we get older. I'm going to tell you why it's important to think about them, though. This is me hanging out. Uh, um, that's Oscar there doing his thing. He rounds. He likes to walk around and do his thing. He'll walk in and out of rooms. Uh, the bottom line is he has the run of the place, he decides where he wants to go. Um, this is Mary Miranda, the nurse who I refer to in the book, uh, the person who put me in my place and sent me on this Oscar journey. Um, she is what nurses should be, uh, interested in her patients, uh, an advocate for her patients. She's really the uh, mama bear, um, to coin a phrase, or to use her own words um, for describing her own practice for the 40 residents on this particular unit. In order to find out about Oscar and really figure out what he was doing, I needed to, to ask somebody. I needed to go out there and, and, and do some investigative work. Uh, I had a, somewhat of a background in journalism. I, I ran one of our student papers uh, in college. And uh, I thought, you know, what better way, if I was going to write a book, uh, about Oscar and try to retell this story and take it away from the Death Cat story at 11 framework. I needed to ask somebody. I tried to ask Oscar. He wasn't really giving me much. Um, so, and the patients, unfortunately, had all gone their, you know, their separate ways. So I went back to the family members. Uh, the first time, I have to say, I did with some trepidation because I had to get on the phone and say, hi, I'm Dr. Dosa. I'd like to talk to you about you know, your mother who died a year ago. And, and I really want to talk about that cat that was there. You do feel kind of a little self-conscious and silly. Um, what I found, though, is that everybody I talked to wanted to talk to me. And they were only too happy to talk about their loved ones and about their experiences with this cat. So some of the questions that I asked them, was Oscar really a death cat? What did they think about this whole experience with Oscar? And what did they perceive the media um, circus to be all about? What did they think of it? And what did Oscar really mean to them? So I went, I conducted a bunch of interviews, and that's what became the framework for this book, um, now in paperback form. I also wanted to hear from them what they thought Oscar could teach each and every one of us. Um, I give several lectures. One of the lectures I, I give is to physicians and, and uh, sort of uh, nurses and, and medical professionals. And what I try to do during that lecture is, is talk, to, talk to them about what these family members really told me to say. For this group, what I'd like to do is to um, use uh, the pearls that I wrote about at the end of the book as a framework for talking about the, the rest of what I'm going to discuss. This, uh, this evening. The book, as anybody who's read it uh, probably realizes, and, and truthfully, I've been blasted on Amazon by a few um, cat lovers who picked up the book and were kind of sad that there was not more cat in it. Um, when I was writing the book, every time I would get out on the phone with the editor, and the editor would say, more cat, more cat, more cat. <laughs> And I would write her back and send her some more stuff, and, and she would write me back and say, more cat, more cat. So the book has plenty of Oscar in it. But as people will realize, it's really a book about the, the, the 
patients and their families. It's a book about uh, caregivers. It's a book about growing older in this country. And I think that when people pick it up, they see themselves through the eyes of the characters in the book. And I think any book that's successful has to speak to people in that kind of manner. So yes, there is Oscar in the book. Yes, there's plenty of it in, in the book. But I really tried to give a little bit more in this book. Uh, and obviously, there's a, it's a book about nursing home care, some place that uh, many of us don't like to think about. Uh, but hopefully this dispels some of the myths of uh, nursing home care around the country. So as I was writing the book, I needed to come up with a sort of an ending for the book, and I needed to sort of decide what was going to be at the end of the book. Uh, you never get to pick the title of your book. You never really get to pick the cover, but obviously I really wanted to try to put something in, in the book that would be relevant for caregivers. Uh, as some people know, uh, or if you've read the book, you, you know, uh, my wife's mother uh, has Alzheimer's dementia. She's uh, 67 and already in an assisted living facility, uh, has been for many years. Uh, as I was writing the book, the events that, that transpired to bring her into the assisted living were going on. And I remember my wife getting off the phone one day with uh, one of her docs uh, in New Jersey. Um, and uh, she was pretty exasperated. I don't even know what they were talking about, although I'm pretty sure my wife won the argument. Um, but the bottom line was that she looked at me and said, is there anything that any of these patients' families have told you that might be useful to, to, to me as I go through this? And I thought about it and said, you know, that's really what I want to put at the end of the book. And thankfully, I work at a place where I work with a lot of wonderful researchers in end-of-life care and, and uh, geriatrics. And I asked all of them, and together we collectively came up with this list of pearls. So. Here are the pearls. Pearl number one, take care of yourself. Seems very intuitive. No one will ever take care of yourself as well as you can you know, on your own accord. I can't tell you as a medical professional how many times I've looked at a patient and seen their smiling face uh, with dementia. They look great. They're on the right meds. They are well taken care of. And then I look over at the caregiver, and they look like crap. I've stopped. Uh, clinic visits. Um, I've even sent a couple caregivers to the hospital. The bottom line is that people don't take care of themselves in this process because they're taking care of somebody else. What's amazing about this disease process and about chronic diseases in general is that often the caregivers die before the person with the disease. Uh, I can't tell you how many times uh, that's happened. One thing that I tell all my caregivers, you're no good to your loved one if you're in the hospital yourself, so you better take care of yourself. A few years back, uh, there was an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association about the burden of caregiving. Um, strange thing, um, caregiving actually carries a burden um, that's similar to smoking. Um, so if you compare caregivers and their age-matched, disease-matched controls, you're actually 63% more likely to die if you're a caregiver than your age-matched control. There's something about caregiving that causes this added stress that leads to um, adverse outcomes and death. Um, it's interesting because dementia actually carries its own burden. There are people who have compared uh, taking care of a uh, cancer patient, for example, to taking care of somebody with dementia. And taking care of somebody with dementia is infinitely worse. And the reason for that, I think, is that when you take care of somebody with dementia, they don't necessarily thank you when you leave. They don't pat you on the back and say, thank you for stopping by. I really appreciated the visit. Instead, oftentimes, you get the reverse. You get anger. You get frustration. And oftentimes, caregivers come out from a meeting with a loved one going, why in the world did I bother? They don't even know who I am anymore. Well, the reality is pearl number two. It's about being present. Um, and that's something that I try to tell all caregivers being present is about validating somebody's life. I think it's incredibly important. Um, chronic disease often teaches us that the future is not absolute. Obviously, it's a lesson that we all need to learn. Oscar's gift, and people have asked me this uh, for quite some time now, what, what do I think Oscar's greatest gift is? He's got nowhere else he needs to be. 
all right? He doesn't have soccer practice to get to. He doesn't have church groups. He doesn't have this. He doesn't have that. We all have the excuses. We all make the same excuses. There's reasons why we don't necessarily want to hang out um, in these types of environments. It has to do with our own mortality. It has to do with our own preoccupations with what's going to happen to me when I get to that stage. Well, the bottom line is that being present is an incredible gift, and it's something that you need to be able to give um, your loved ones as they get older. Pearl number three, celebrate the little victories. Uh, I use this, um, and usually I read a, a section from the book here because I think uh, one of the women in the book says it much better than, than I could. On page 18, I remembered running into Kathy and her mother seated on a bench in the nursing home's rose garden one afternoon. It was a particularly windy October day and I wondered what on earth they were doing outdoors huddled in their jackets besides their empty lunch trays. Aren't you cold? I had asked Kathy. I prefer to think of it as brisk, she had joked. You know, for the next three to four months, my mother is going to be cooped up inside. What's a little cold? And look how lovely the leaves are at this time of year. Kathy had glanced over at her mother and placed an arm around her shoulder. Aren't they beautiful, Mom? She had asked, pointing to the last of the red and gold leaves on a nearby tree. Her mother said nothing, but there was a hint of a smile on her face. Little victories, Dr. Dosa, Kathy reminded me as I walked quickly out of the cold that day. Little victories are about embracing the good times. Um, the disease trajectory of dementia is, is downward. We don't have cures for dementia. We don't have a drug that will turn it in, on its head and send patients the other way. Uh, unfortunately, this is a disease process that over time results in people getting worse. Um, but there are good days, and there are recalled memories. There are days where you can share something with a loved one um, that perhaps on a different day you might not be able to. And, and it really is. The caregivers who do a better job are the ones that can embrace those little victories but still put the, the bigger disease process into context. Rocky Road Ice Cream. I remember about a year and a half ago, I was on the third floor, and, and one of the nurses came up to me, exasperated. Mrs. Smith's sugar is 550, and we have no idea why. And I said, well, let me go take a look at her. So I walked down the hall and walked into Mrs. Smith's room, and one of her daughters was in the room. And as soon as I walked into the room, I knocked first, and there was a big rustling, and something went underneath the bed. <laughs> I sat down and looked at the daughter and asked her how she was doing and, you know, how's your mom? You know, we, we kind of did the little small, small talk thing for a while and, and I said, you know, your mom's sugars are pretty high. Do you have any idea why they're so high? And she kind of looked down on the floor, you know, kind of, and then sheepishly she, she pulled out this tub of Rocky Road ice cream. So anyway, long story short, I told her that that's probably not the best idea for your mother who's a brittle diabetic. And, and she started to spoon the Rocky Road ice cream and, and looked at her mother and said, look how happy she is, doctor. I can't take that away from her. And I looked at the two of them and realized this was her little victory. This was about her spending her time with her mother in the best way that she knew how. And after a few minutes, I sat there and said, well, I understand, you know, we'll, we'll take care of this. And, and I walked out. Um, and of course, the nurse accosted me as I was halfway down the hall. What would you find out? What would you find out? What are we going to do? And I said, well, you know, I have no idea why her sugars are so high. <laughs> but, you know, maybe we don't have to check her sugars. And all of a sudden, the nurse said, yeah, we can do that. And to that day, I think, until the woman died uh, a few months back, she continued to get her Rocky Road ice cream. Why I use this as a, as a story is the fact that we have choices in our medical care, and sometimes we don't embrace the, you know, we don't embrace that. We don't, we don't tell our doctors what it is that we want. And for this woman, it was all about that, you know, act of feeding her mother Rocky Road ice cream. She didn't care what the sugars were. And truthfully, I probably shouldn't have either. Pearl number four is about becoming an advocate for high quality care. Uh, I'll spend a little time here talking a little bit about how healthcare is changing.
Uh, and we need to work towards improving the quality of our health care. Um, for those of you scoring at home, our quality of health care is not particularly good. If you compare it with other countries around the world, we do pretty lousy um, if you're objectively scoring at home. Um, and I have a little bit here about talking to your own doctor about your own preferences. We'll get to that in a minute. So who is this man? There's a free book in it for anybody who can tell me who the man is and how old he was when he died. Other answers. Socrates, how old was he when he died? 107. No, he wasn't that old. How old was Socrates when he died? <laughs> Show of hands, 25, 40, 55, 70, 85, 92. All right, he was 70 when he died. And now if my age is still to be prolonged, I know I cannot escape paying the penalty of old age and increasing dimness of sight and dullness of hearing. I shall find myself slower to learn new lessons and apter to forget the lessons I have learned. And if to these be added the consciousness of failing powers, the sting of self-reproach, what prospect have I of any further joy of living? So this is something that Socrates told one of his pupils a few days before he died. Um, Socrates was old back in the day. How many people in this room are over the age of 70? A number of you. Average life expectancy. Why do I bring this up? Old age has changed over time. Back in ancient Rome, um, in ancient Greece, when Socrates was alive, uh, the average life expectancy was only 25 years. Um, yeah. Good question. Um, the answer is statistics have a way of lying, so you're absolutely right. Um, this is, in part, predicated on infant mortality. But even when you take infant mortality into account, the numbers were only in the high 30s. Okay? 18th century England, 35 years. Um, that's when the uh, sanitation developed and the toilet and wonderful public health uh, infrastructure started uh, that has really increased our, our, quali our quality of life and our longevity. Even in 1900, the average life expectancy was only 47. So what's happened over the last 100 years? Um, we don't have the 2010 census figures um, quite yet, but I'll probably update that in the near future. But back in 2000, the average age was over the age of 80 for a woman and 74 for a man. For those reaching adulthood, 85 plus for a woman and 80 for a man. Our population over the age of 65 is skyrocketing. By 2020, 21% 20, of our population will be over the age of 65. Our population over the age of 85 um, is also rapidly increasing. In 1990, there were only 3 million people. Um, by 2050, there'll be over 15 million people. All right, the impact of this demographic trend will be tremendous. Why will it be tremendous? Because we're not growing healthy old people. Here's the Social Security Administration's actuarial table. This is actually how they know how much they need to put into Social Security. Um, what's interesting um, is if you look on the left, those numbers have increased every decade over the course of the last uh, 20, 30 years. But if you look on the right, those numbers have stayed flat. So we are growing an older, more disabled, more chronically ill population. And our health care system, I hazard to say, is completely inadequately prepared to deal with that. Here's the leading causes of death in the United States in 1900. All stuff we have a pill for these days, with the exception of maybe cerebrovascular disease. Here's the causes of US deaths um, in 2003. Diseases of the heart, malignant neoplasm, cerebrovascular disease, chronic lung disease, Alzheimer's disease. They're all chronic diseases. In 2005, half of the Americans had at least one chronic disease. 70% of all deaths are attributable to chronic diseases. And our chronic disease price tag is 75% of our $2 trillion medical price tag. 
The cost of Alzheimer's disease is estimated to be 100 billion per year, and if you follow those statistics, they are rapidly increasing year by year. Every year, the Alzheimer's Association holds a press conference and releases the new ones, and each year they're much worse than they were the year prior. The bottom line, though, is that we have a healthcare system that is wonderfully equipped to deal with acute medical care, because that's what it was invented for. Um, when we were dealing with things like pneumonia and um, heart attacks and things of that sort. We fix those problems now. Um, certainly people die of those things, but the reality is that most of the time they die after their fourth heart attack or their fifth heart attack. And the care that we provide after the heart attack is really where we suffer. Um, and it's even worse when you're dealing with things like dementia or COPD. <coughs> So what do we need to do? We need to demand changes from our politicians to improve our health care delivery. We need to address these chronic medical conditions. I still can't believe that our health care system doesn't pay for our care coordination. Um, it honestly does not. Um, unfortunately, as a health care provider, I can't provide physical therapy for my patients. I can once they break their hip. But what kind of stupid health care system do you need to have that requires you to break the hip before you order the preventive um, treatment. My, my mother had a colonoscopy the other day. Um, yes, Medicare now pays for the colonoscopy, but guess what? They don't pay for the medication to prep you. I was stunned when I heard that because honestly I thought that they did pay for it. But the bottom line, we have a healthcare system that is completely inadequate for what we're growing. Healthcare quality is highly variable. Here's the rate of persistent pain in United States nursing homes. I don't really want you to take that in as much as I want you to see that it's different everywhere. Um, I look at nursing homes, that's what I do. I study nursing homes. If I put this up for hospitals, it would look very similar. Here's the rate of healthcare transitions in the last six months of life. We are now starting to look at healthcare transitions as a marker of poor quality care. What do I mean by healthcare transitions? It's the bouncing around that people do at the end of life. It's the tag, you're it, you're the hot potato, I want nothing to do with you. Um, that happens at the end of life as somebody bounces from an acute hospital back to home, to a home care agency, then back to the hospital, then to a nursing home, then to a specialist, then to another specialist, and guess what? Nobody ever talks to one another. Um, why? Because our healthcare system is not designed that way. So why care about nursing homes? I get asked this all the time. Why would I care about nursing homes? Well, here's the proportion of deaths occurring in nursing homes. So on the right there, that's Rhode Island. Um, again, what I want you to take from this is that it's changing. Um, from Arkansas was in the 20 to 23 range uh, back in 1989. Um, everybody's gotten worse. Um, as you see, it's much more dark in, in this chart. So we are now a nation that is also dying in the nursing home. If you have dementia, your likelihood of dying in a nursing home is upwards of 80%. So you should care about what goes on in these types of facilities, and you should care about the fact that our healthcare system does not pay for nursing home care. You pay for it until you're bankrupted, and then the state pays for it until the state is bankrupted. And that's already happened in multiple states. California, for example, can't pay their Medicaid bills. They stop paying after nine months. And guess what? Nursing homes get nothing for three months until they catch up. Um, each year, it gets worse and worse. And that's what's happening with our healthcare system. The banking industry was first. The Medicaid problem is going to be second. I guarantee you that. Um, we have to fix the problem. So what should we be after? Well, we should be after a lot of things. And I'm not here to, to talk about healthcare policy. We could have a whole separate talk on, on that. But we want to make nursing homes more like a home than a nursing home. One of the ways we do that is with pet therapy programs and culture change programs. We want to make these places more like homes because more and more of us are going to be living in places like that. We want to advocate for increased reimbursement. These places operate on a razor's edge in terms of profitability. If they get cut, then nursing homes close. And guess what? You have fewer choices in terms of where you're going to go if you break your hip and need rehab. 
And we need to advocate for the presence of hospice. Do you know that hospice is the most popular thing in our healthcare industry? There's nothing, when you do surveys of, of patients and their um, bereaved family members, there's absolutely nothing in our healthcare system that's greeted with the same satisfaction as hospice. Um, but guess what? It's on the chopping block. And when you look at it, it's one of the things that people want to get rid of because more and more people are using it. Strange thing, if you use hospice, you actually live longer. Do people know that? Um, a lot of people think that hospice is about hanging the morphine and walking away. But if you do studies, people on hospice live longer than their disease-matched controls. So why is end-of-life care important? Well. I'd rather die with a cat on my bed than hooked up to a machine in the ICU. That's a quote that uh, a lovely woman in Edmonton um, wrote me um, after the book came out. Um, I think it's wonderful because it just puts the whole Oscar the cat sort of metaphor into place. What we're talking about is the metaphor that people would rather die with quality of life um, rather than quantity of life. And that's really what we're talking. It's a quality versus quantity argument. 90% of people want quality over quantity when you ask them. But our healthcare system is designed for, for quantity rather than quality. Um, so we need to change that. We really need to do a better job as physicians, and I embrace this because we, we doctors are horrible at talking to our, our patients uh, about end of life care. Do you know what those death panels were all about? Death panels were about paying physicians to talk to their patients about end-of-life wishes. It had nothing to do with rationing care. It had nothing to do with any of that. It was about asking people, what do you want at the end of the life? Do you want to die with a cat in your bed, or do you want to die in an ICU with tubes and, and all of that? And the bottom line is, again, 90% of people want the quality, they want the cat, but our healthcare system is designed for, for the opposite. My last slide, pearl number five, is about love and let go. Um, we have a lot of healthcare problems. We have a lot of diseases that we have no solutions for. Um, one of the characters in the book has a tremendous degree of difficulty in the book uh, uh, with letting go. I always try to remind caregivers that the last act of love is really about letting go of somebody where there is no cure. Um, and it is an act of love. Um, so when you think about these things, I want you to internalize that. Um, I want you to talk to your doctors about what it is you want. There's nothing better that you can do for a loved one or a family member than to tell them what it is you want at the end of life. Um, the reason being is I've seen family members agonize over these decisions, and it doesn't have to be that way. If we just spent a little time talking to our loved ones about what it is that we want, it wouldn't be that way. When it's time, the deepest act of love is being able to say goodbye and let go. And with that, I'll close my remarks. I'm more than happy to answer any questions about Oscar and what it is he does and how he does what he does. Um, but thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Dose, for that. If you do raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you right yes. in the white. There we go. I have a comment and two questions. Sure. They're quick questions. Uh, FYI, Kroger has fat-free Rocky Road ice cream. <laughs> oh, oh, not fat-free, sugar-free. Sugar-free Rocky Road ice cream. Uh, my questions are, um, does this facility have only dementia patients, or are there patients with, with terminal physical illnesses as well? And my second question is, if I can remember it, <laughs> oh, I can't believe it. I'll, I'll give you a chance. I'll answer your first question I'm sorry. first. Um, the question was, does this facility have uh, um, other um, medical problems uh, that they deal with. Yes, it's a, a classic nursing home in the sense that they deal with rehabilitation patients, they deal with uh, um, terminal dementia patients, and they deal with uh, patients rehabbing from various different ailments. It's about a 40-40-40 split, I would say. 40, you know, 40 patients are, are there for rehab. There are 40 uh, patients that are 
long stairs with other medical um, conditions, and then we have the dementia unit, which is uh, also about 40 patients. How does Oscar know? All right. How does Oscar know? That's the number two question that I get um, after can we breed Oscar. Uh, Oscar, I believe, knows, and again, I've tried to ask him and he's not telling, but uh, there's biological plausibility in the idea that cells, when they are in the dying process, release chemicals and pheromones. Um, uh, we know that cells release ketones, uh, which are sweet-smelling chemicals, and, and it's in all likelihood the reason why he's responding, he's responding, he's smelling it. Uh, the better question, I think, is what's in it for him? Just because he can smell it, why does he care? Uh, that, that is a harder question to answer. Uh, my sense is that at this point, it's probably behavioral, um, that he's been conditioned now because everybody makes a fuss, uh, that he should be there at the end of life. Uh, but there are times where he is the first to know. So he's obviously responding to the scent, but I think he's now conditioned behaviorally to be there because we, we like it when he's there. Other questions? Right now. Yes. It's coming behind you. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, how many patients uh, have died during Oscar's time where he didn't do the vigil? Um, we know of one for sure. Well, there, there have been a couple. One, he was at the vets, so that doesn't count. Um, when Mary Miranda, the nurse in the book, left Steerhouse, she left about a year and a half ago and took a job somewhere else, which unfortunately is one of the pitfalls with our nursing um, homes today that they can't afford to keep good help. Uh, and you know, oftentimes people will go down the street for a dollar fifty more or whatever, but the bottom line is she left. She was Oscar's person and they had a huge bond and when she left he disappeared for about three weeks. and. Nobody kind of knows where he went. He sort of hid somewhere. He was in a closet. So he missed a death during that time period. But since that, uh, he has returned to the job. Um, obviously, he's a cat, and he may one day decide he's got bigger and better things to do. Um, but for the time being, he seems to be uh, showing up and, and holding these vigils. So he hasn't missed many. Right here. In the front here. Hi, my name is Evelyn A. Gibbons, and I'm here with Dr. Otters. We have our gerontology class here, and I did a report on your book, well, and you. I'm honored to meet you. And my question is, in one of the books, in the book that I read, it said that the nurses thought they were smarter than Oscar, mm -hmm. where they put Oscar in the bed thinking the patient was going to die, and the patient didn't die. So when it was time for the patient to die, Oscar was there. Right. Now, when you did your study, I think you did, what was it, 50 studies that you watched Oscar, or how many times did you watch Oscar before you actually Well, we, we know that he's been, he's been there, and he's been, uh, what we did was not a formal study. I mean, there was no control group, there was no whatever. It was an observational study based on, and, and there's lots of biases in observation. There's no, there's no doubt about that. Um, but your, your question had to do with... Uh, your before you actually yeah. did the paper on Oscar, what was your belief that Oscar was really, truly the death cat? Uh, my belief was that he was showing up at deaths. Uh, you, you know, you only need to ask a hospice nurse to know that animals are very perceptive. Uh, I had a dog growing up, and you know, the dog wanted nothing to do with me unless I was sick, and then he was right by my side. I think we've, a lot of us have had that experience. So the idea that Oscar could be determining that somebody was sick, you know, these are all his family members, the 40 people on the floor. And the idea that he would be there when he was needed seems to be, you know, kind of a logical kind of thing. Uh, but I think, you know, we kind of joked about it. It was sort of, I don't think we sort of took it as seriously as, as we, we did eventually. But um, in the beginning, I, I kind of had my doubts about it. I, I, but 
I, you know, I, when you watch it happen and you watch it happen repeatedly, it becomes easier to buy into the fact. And, and there have been cases where Oscar seemingly has been the first to know. Um, it has to do with the fact that it's very difficult at the end of life sometimes to know exactly when somebody's going to pass, uh, particularly with dementia because the, the, the net trajectory is downward. But you never know whether the next acute illness on top of the dementia is what's going to cause them to pass on. Uh, and quite frequently, they don't. They rebound and they get a little worse each time, but you know, they rebound for a period of time. So the idea that he might show up, um, it's a little humbling as a physician to know that sometimes he's more right than we are. I think you, you made that point in the original uh, study that you had sent in, was that the at first cat that he went to that day, I'm sorry, the first patient that he went to that day seemed to be on the way out, and, yeah. and you guys were kind of thinking that it might have been, and he, he left and then went to another patient who was more or less on the way up that yeah. did pass away. And, and that definitely happened. I mean, on several occasions, nurses have, have for, or aides have brought Oscar to bedsides and said, you know, you're in the wrong place. And he doesn't hang out unless somebody, I mean, he, he literally, that, that one day, he raced out of the room as quickly as he could, and he went right back to the room he was in. And that patient did die, you know, six hours later. Our patient rebounded and was alive, you know, three days later. But uh, about four hours or five hours before that patient died, Oscar was back. So, so the idea that he's responding to something, I mean, seems very biologically plausible. And, um, yes? Are there any biochemical detectors that are that are sensitive enough to detect the uh, uh, I mean, none that, yeah, the, the question is, uh, are there any um, markers or, or are there any machines that could pick up on uh, biochemical markers like this that might help us? Uh, you, you know, it's, a, it's an area where investigation is probably worthwhile. Uh, I, we've heard of stories of dogs being able to sniff out cancer and actually with, in some cases, greater efficacy than CT scanning. Uh, so the, Yes, I, I think it's an area we should study. There is no machine that I know of that can that can do it as of yet. But uh, but this idea of um, you know bio, biochemicals or pheromones that are released is uh, I think is certainly very possible. Can we go in the back? Uh, yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, I was very interested. Um, in, in Oscar, but also more so in the last part of your um, uh, lecture about um, your advocacy and uh, the things that, um, because I also consider myself an advocate for the elderly, and um, I've been in plenty of nursing homes and seen um, the, the efficacy that, that just having an animal changes the energy Absolutely. Of, of, the, of, the, uh, of what's going on in the whole all of a sudden things just don't seem so so down bleak, bleak. exactly yeah. um but i was i was really wondering uh what what do you think we could do not as animal lovers but as, as advocates for the elderly to see that um, that there are more pet therapy programs that there, that nursing homes become more home like that um, because what I see is most of the nursing homes I'm aware of are run by corporations and corporations it's all about the bottom line sure um, and I like you said most nursing homes are run on um, a shoestring and they're they're stretched to the max and the healthcare system is not helping you know what's going on with all the health care reform and everything's not helping that so I was just wondering what could we do well, I think your first question about animal programs, uh, I always tell people I'm more proud of the fact that Steer has, has a robust program and we have six animals. I mean, Oscar obviously is our famous animal, but I think he has as much um, effect on the patients as the other five cats do. Uh, in some cases, actually, I think his, uh, his buddy on the floor, Maya, uh, actually is, is, is better for the patients because she spends time with the, you know, with the patients when they're, you know, actually doing better. Uh, <laughs> but 
I think stories like this helps help spotlight that it is an important thing. There's still six states, I think, in the country that don't allow animals in healthcare facilities. I think that that's ridiculous. Uh, one of the questions I always get asked is allergies, allergies, isn't you know? I actually had somebody write in a, 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 a column. I, one of the major newspapers after this was published, uh, you know, sort of bashing us that we were killing our patients based on cat allergies. And, you know, I can, I can assure you that, you know, 60 or 70 patients haven't died from cat allergies over the course of the last five years. And it's really the dementia that unfortunately is, is, is doing them in. Uh, the, what you can do, I think, is talk talk to healthcare facilities about it. Uh, I, the more that we talk to them, uh, the more that they're likely to do, to do this. CMS, uh, the organization that obviously handles healthcare finances, has, has uh, developed a, a major culture change initiative within nursing homes. So I think there is more advocacy for culture change, uh, of which pet therapy is one of those things uh, over the course of the last four or five years, but we're still in the infancy in terms of that. I think there are wonderful demonstration projects that are out there, sort of these so-called greenhouse nursing homes and um, wonderful programs where people have actually tried to take it to the next level, not just having an animal, but taking it to the next level. And, and uh, the more that we find out about these places, I think the more we'll be able to convince the um, the almighty dollar of the corporations that they ought to invest in it too. But the only way we can do that is by suggesting, you know, that we prefer to go to this place rather than that place, and then the corporation will follow suit. Uh, unfortunately, we don't always have a lot of say because, truthfully, in most cases, it's the uh, case manager in the hospital who tells us which nursing home we're going to, you know, when we're ready for discharge. We have time for uh, two quick more questions. You had one in. No. Okay. Up, up here. Have you ever had a time when the, the hospital was conflicted between two patients that were dying and more than one patient? That, the question is, have we ever had a time where Oscar's been conflicted with multiple patients dying at once? And the answer is yes. Uh, there have been a couple occasions where he's run backwards and forwards between rooms. Uh, he usually picks you know, eventually he'll pick one, and you know he's been invariably thus far right in terms of picking the one that will die sooner. Um, it, it hasn't happened that often, um, but it has happened on a couple of occasions. Yes. Sure. Uh, Hold on one second. One second. Uh, how reluctant or how willing do you think doctors are, family doctors? to suggest hospice to their patients when that time comes? Well, I think doctors don't know enough about hospice in general, and, and particularly a lot of the specialty doctors. Uh, we do know, for example, when you look at the, the causes of death, heart, heart failure, you know, coronary disease, heart failure, um, COPD, dementia, I think we've done a better job uh, in terms of end-of-life care with oncology patients. But that's a lot easier because usually you can point to an x-ray and say, you have a big mass here, that shouldn't be here. And it registers with, with, with patients. It's a lot harder when you're dealing with somebody, for example, with COPD, um, where they have these sort of frequent exacerbations. I, I think we're doing a better job now with dementia. Uh, years ago, you couldn't list dementia as a cause of death. Now it's the fifth or sixth uh, leading cause of death if you look at the, the latest figures. So we're doing a better job. Um, but you know we still have um, you know some some way to go in terms of education. I think getting the word out that again hospice is more than just um, hospice is more than just hanging the morphine. It's actually a Medicare benefit uh, that opens the door to a lot of things that normally as a physician I can't prescribe. I mean I can send an aide in to the home to bathe somebody. I can't do that under normal circumstances. But if they're in hospice, I can. Um, so it's, it's about understanding what hospice is, and a lot of physicians still don't understand it. They're still sort of left with, you know, this sort of 80s version of what hospice was, hanging the morphine and walking away. Well, Dr. Tosa, thank you for sharing those pearls from uh, Oscar the Cat.